welcome to your episode 304 of the At Percussion podcast. With me, as always, are my lovely co-host, Carly Vigna. Hey, Ben. How's it going? Hey, Carly. Long time no see. Oh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Casey Cangelosi. Hey, what's up, Ben? Hey, buddy. Uh, so we are recording this episode on October 17th. This is a double header. We recorded Emmanuel Session a few hours ago earlier today, and we are releasing this episode on November 4th. Carly, what happened in history on November 4th? Yeah, November 4th was actually seemingly a super good day for world premieres. Um, so here's the first one that I'll share with you. In 1876, on November 4th, um, Brahms' first symphony was premiered. Um, some of you might know, like his his first symphony was such this big, like monolithic, I think, hurdle for him to get over in his composition. So anyway, that's a, that's a big deal. A um, couple years later, six years later, in 1882, was the first performance of Smetna's uh, Ma Vlast. Probably we've played that or heard that. In 1883, just one year later, was the premiere of Chabrier's Espana. Pretty cool in Paris. Um, and in 1890, it was the first performance of Borodin's Prince Igor. Um, and actually, I was just hearing on the radio the other day that um, Rimsky-Korsakov and Glazunov finished like a, a section of the opera, I think, because Borodin actually passed away in 1887, a couple years before it premiered. Um, then in 1899, so still same decade as Prince Igor, was the premiere of Sibelius's Finlandia, um, sung in Swedish in Stockholm. So I'm sure that was... Uh, amazing to hear. And then here's one that might be a little bit more interesting for percussionists is the premiere of Silvestre Revuelta's symphonic poem. It's called Ventanas, um, which means windows in Spanish, um, for orchestra in 1932 on November 4th by the Orquesta uh, Sinfonica de Mexico in Mexico City. Um, and it has really, really prominent percussion parts like a lot of his music. Um, this one in particular has timpani, bass drum, crash and suspended cymbal, snare drum, ratchet, tam-tam, and then a thunder sheet. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about this piece um, and, and some of it, like reception of it. In 1944, Aaron Copeland wrote, this was in a personal letter. Um, I guess he was, he was staying in Mexico at the time. So he wrote, we are only two hours from Mexico City. So I've heard the Sinfonica several times. Chavez played a piece of Revueltas called Ventanas. It's very amusing to listen to, chock full of orchestral color. And then he says, but the form isn't very good, I'm afraid. He was like a modern painter who throws marvelous daubs of color on canvas that practically takes your eye out, but it doesn't add up. Too bad, because he was a, a gifted guy. So that's a Google <laughs> take on this piece. Um, but then later, the fast forward about 50 years, um, there was a review in 1999 of Esa Pekka Salonen's recording of this piece, um, which was a, a, a better review, much more positive. Um, they call it a minor masterpiece, describing it as cinematic and rhapsodic with primitive ritualistic episodes recalling Sensa Maja, but also with delightful interludes in the Mexican folk style, a blues tinged oboe theme, impassioned violins, and a drunken orgiastic coda that builds to an appropriately festive climax, um, which of course has tons of percussion. And I, I listen, it's about 10 minutes long. It's, it's, I think it's really cool. So if you feel inclined to check out Ventanas by Revoltas, um, go ahead, give it a listen. Awesome, thanks so much, Carly, wonderful. Well, let's get on to introducing our guest for today. Our guest today is Ben Walland. Ben is a Grammy-nominated educator, composer, and performer in the Chicago area. He teaches at Northern Illinois University and the College of DuPage. His compositions, which include hard-boiled capitalism, the whimsical nature of small particle physics, and Pegasus, are all becoming uh, standards in the percussion repertoire very rapidly. And we discovered right before we clicked record that actually all three of us hosts today are working on Ben's pieces right now. So welcome to the podcast, Ben. Thank you so very much. It's nice to be here. And I wanted to mention that uh, Ben and I recently met because he invited me to perform an, on his Mile Marker Zero project at PASIC. Uh, for anyone interesting, Ben and I and a host of other Yamaha artists will be performing in Room 105 at PASIC at 3 o'clock on Thursday, November 11th, if you want to come check out some very cool, exciting new works. Uh, Ben's works, uh, Mile Marker Zero, were composed during a Key West residency. Ben, can you tell us about that residency and I think 
Carly and I probably know what the title means, but maybe you could explain that to our viewers that aren't so familiar with Florida. I'm certainly happy, happy to. Thank you. Uh, the Biomarker Zero project was part of that month-long residency that I enjoyed in Key West. There's uh, an organization there simply called The Studios, and they host artists um, in all walks of life. I was just one of many uh, that they had seen during that season. In fact, during my stay there for four weeks, there was also a poet there as well as a visual artist, a poet named Sarah Fruner and a visual artist, uh, Laurel Clark. We basically hung around and just created our craft for a week or for a month. It was uh, quite terrific. Um, during that time, I had a room to myself. I had brought down one of my marimbas, a four and a third Yamaha Rosewood, and uh, I was simply looking to compose a handful of pieces inspired by my experience there. Part of the application process, um, I did detail about a need in our repertoire uh, for students who have access to a four and a third, but not a five octave instrument. Um, of course, that's uh, both cost prohibitive for a lot of young adults, but also space prohibitive as well. During that time, I got to know a lot of people in the Key West community. My wife and I had visited uh, the Florida Keys a couple of times beforehand, so I didn't feel like I didn't I didn't feel like I had to go see all of the sites that this touristy island had. So I was a little more comfortable just kind of hanging around meeting people. And this collection of about a dozen pieces um, are all inspired by the people I met or some of the adventures we enjoyed when we were together. It made me uh, very happy to be involved in this project because every spring break, uh, I made it a point when I was in Florida, uh, unfortunately not anymore, but I made it a point to drive down to the Keys and eat key lime pie. That was a habit oh. every year I was in Florida, or as they call it locally, lime pie. Um, <laughs> terrible joke. Um, but you've got this this new collection of 4.3 octave marimba pieces, and you you touched on this a little bit. But there seems to be this new push for quality repertoire accessible to all students on 4.3 octave marimbas. Uh, Ivan Trevino, I think, just released a new book of duos. I saw Pius Cheng uh, pushing his his new book of solos. I think it's called Colors. Uh, and this project certainly reflects that desire. What do you think are some of the unique challenges of writing for this smaller range? And do you have any other, uh, any favorite pieces by other composers that you feel tackle these challenges well? Yes, I'd like to address the first line of inquiry first though, uh, uh, about the four and third octave repertoire. Um, it feels to me like in Marimba's uh, history, we've been so excited to explore extended range that sometimes we haven't camped out long enough in the, in the ranges we do have. Uh, not much unlike a lot of our compositional ideas too in the percussion community. We're, we're kind of preoccupied with ex exploring new, 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 um, and then to simply enjoy and engage what it is that we have sometimes. Uh, we're overlooking a, a wonderful fount of opportunities. The four and a third idea, um, I, I suspect it's super popular now. It's probably a target rich environment, first of all, for sales for a lot of people, uh, if they're considering their students um, at home, uh, many of whom who have a four and a third. That's probably uh, been part of that. Uh, perhaps a lot of composers also found themselves at home with a four and a third. Um, of course, during the last year and a half. For me, this was in 2018 and 2019 when I launched this, pro this, uh, this project. I was just on the heels of spending about 15 years teaching exclusively high school and middle school students. And we were running into the problem where um, they would kind of hit your standard rep and then just not have access to that next big thing. And if they did, it was a project that would last well past a semester or a year. Um, so for me, that was kind of the genesis of this issue. Uh, I, I certainly see why people would be doing this in the last year or two, but uh, for me, it wasn't necessarily born of COVID, uh, but certainly from a student need that I saw from uh, on the part of my kids. Well, it's really, really good timing. I'm <laughs> glad to see these, these projects coming out of the woodworks because we've all spent so much time in the last year or two, like scrounging for, well, I need more repertoire. <laughs> well, a little spooky, yeah. And one of the things I like about this project in particular is it's it's not designed to be a pedagogical tool. So it's not uh, it's not about an, uh, a beginning, intermediate, or uh, advanced sort of idea. Um, there are a, a number of really good collections for four and a third that way. But I think 
I was gearing a little more toward the idea of a muster etude, something that you can blast, something that you could throw uh, on a program and not have to be too concerned about um, the audience appeal, um, but also it's plenty engaging for the performer. I, uh, I have this great idea. If I ever get to pick the rep for a marimba competition, the final round is going to require a muster etude because <laughs> I would love to see like someone go up, nail like velocities in Merlin and then just eat it on like muster etude and see. <laughs> well, some of those guys are brutal. The harmonies, yeah. like you just pop these like major sixths and stuff. And I, I think that brings us to the second part of your question. Like what's what's tricky about the four and a third is all of the all of the targets are smaller and the intervals are smaller and it like demands so much torque when you're uh, when you're like trying to play alternate alternating strokes in a a third on the upper register than the lower register right and i, I think also like stating the obvious it, it just it doesn't sound as pretty it doesn't have that beautiful warm resonance of the the cello range of marimba well i I, I like hearing you describe it that way because that's something I've struggled with uh, over the course of my lifetime is I, I don't I, I used to think lower register marimba was prettier than upper register but then there are some pieces that they just speak to what upper register can and should be um, offhand I'm thinking of the Tanaka two movements um, like he just knows how to make that happen and I, I think when people uh, approach the marimba the upper register of the marimba not like a disappointing version of the lower register but instead <laughs> like a bass xylophone or something uh, it, it could be a really rewarding space because the notes do speak faster um we just feel much more vulnerable because of well uh, it's it's more challenging up there and we don't spend as much time on that top octave and a half and also you're standing there and all of a sudden people can see your legs and stuff like it's it's weird to be playing in the upper register with the marimba because uh, also our hands are just inclined to play that middle register and that lower register um but i've i've really enjoyed camping out of that upper register and that's kind of given new life to the instrument for me yeah you mentioned the tanaka two movements which is just an absolute classic and i think that People probably don't play it as much these days because there is so much great five octave rep. And uh, I wanted to mention also the the two big David Maslanka pieces. I think My Lady White is also four and a third, but I know for sure Variations on Lost Love is. Yeah. Um, and the way that you describe it, like that, trying to make that upper register so hauntingly beautiful, I think David Maslanka does a great job with. Yeah. I had a teacher in undergrad who um, he was really big on listening to the room when you would play and we would do exercises when we would play like where you would maybe hit like a, a, a high d right and uh and he would ask you to clap when you quit hearing it in the room right uh, and I, I slowly came to understand that there was much more resonance in the upper register than i thought so like when i hear the maslanka i'll often hear people just trying to get to the next thing as soon as possible instead of enjoying the space for what it is yeah, and if, if anyone's not familiar with this work, it's uh, it's also, it's not for the faint of heart. It was written for Lee Stevens. It's unbelievably difficult. I think more difficult than most of our five octave repertoire. It's not a, not a junior piece by any stretch. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ben, uh, speaking of your new collection, I'm playing a piece in it called Service Industry, uh, which I found fascinating. It has a lot of very unique challenges. Uh, like for one thing, the hands run in different lengths of cycles. So for a lot of it, the left hand is sort of like in a pseudo six, eight part and the right hand's playing in five, four and four, four on top of it. Uh, and then also there's these virtuosic 16th note passages, actually pretty reminiscent of some of Casey's pieces where you're rotating on one hand sort of for a little microchromatic lick. Where did you come up with these unique things in this piece? And were there any other, uh, uh, unique things in the other pieces that we can look forward to hearing. Sure. First, I want to apologize about that. That must have taken a while to kind of pull together. <laughs> uh, it's been a fun challenge. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. And uh, I just want everyone hearing this to understand it's uh, part of this project in that we have a dozen different performers, uh, each person playing one of these pieces of coming up. It's been a real hoot getting to uh, check out each person's process. and. And Ben was just slaying it even a month out. So I, I'm just really excited that that you're taking this on. Thank you. The the patterns that informed this, um, I, I suppose it has a lot to do with when I was in high school. I was a student. I was living in North Dakota, and I was at a day of percussion where 
oh gosh, the guests were uh, Michael Burrett back when he was teaching at Kent in Ohio. Um, there was Pete Erskine. Uh, there was Michael Rosen, and this was all being hosted by Dave Eiler. God, and slackers. Well, <laughs> and and here I was a sophomore in high school, and I was all about drum set and snare drum. And when I saw Burrett, it it kind of changed me. And he was just giving a, a presentation about the fundamentals of four mallets. And someone asked him at the end of this, and they said, "Hey, how do you get good at this?" And he said, "Well, there's this book called The Method of Movement for Marimba. You should go buy it and and work on it." So, so I did. I, I went home. I didn't have a teacher. I just went to our local college and they let me practice on their instrument there. And for two years, I just worked out of method of movement. So I, I don't know many people that actually did the years. You know how in the book, there's like the third section that says 10 years later. Like, like I, I have this dirty book of just like the, the incremental. So growing up, I, I had worked a lot on technique, but not much on rep. And around that time, uh, I had been introduced to Steve Reich and uh, John Adams, not John Luther Adams, but John Adams. So uh, minimalists and post minimalists. And uh, so I didn't really have a strong harmonic uh, concept, but uh, but I quickly started developing rhythmic ones. And that, that quickly informed my relationship with the instrument because I just didn't have much access to rep. So I, I think that for me at a young age probably kind of spawned my relationship with with rhythm and how it informs how I work. So those patterns, uh, I think I was working in a really pattern derivative way. I suppose a lot of big band stuff was maybe moving that way as well. And ostinato exercises. Um, around that time, I heard the Julie Spencer album Ask and was lucky enough to meet her the next summer at a camp. And I had this idea that this is just what marimbists sound like. So I thought, okay, well, it, I guess I'm supposed to do one handed rolls. So let's do this. And so it's just I just spent a lot of high school doing that. So then by the time I hit college, uh, it was just part of my vocabulary, but though clearly not as healthy as Julie. And then it blew my mind a couple of years later to realize she was doing it with uh, two mallets instead of four. So uh, again, I went back to feeling woefully inadequate. Yeah, so I think that was what informed uh, that part of my writing. As far as this piece in general, um, your uh, your selection, uh, harmonically speaking, uh, there's a lot of chromatic uh, material, but there's also a lot of whole tone material too. And uh, whole tone material can be kind of both a blessing and a curse on our instrument. Uh, one of the things I enjoy about whole tone scales is you can get from tonic to tonic like 25% faster, right? So like, so if you kind of you can just kind of tear all of, all apart the register really fast. Uh, and chromatic stuff, uh, you get a lot of rhythm out of it, and you don't necessarily eat up all of, all of your real estate and a melody and whatnot. In terms of like a, a more grown up relationship with that technique, however, I think it was in my master's program. I was working on a on a Mozart uh, piano sonata. I, I was trying really hard to apply that to a marimba, uh, which I'd like to think I successfully did, but it it really kind of it ate up a good chunk of my master's degree because uh, here you have stuff that clearly isn't written for four, uh, four mallets. And it put me in a place to have to learn how to uh, quickly, well, uh, the Theodore Milkov business, right? Um, I'm just nowhere nearly as good at, at it as he is, but it also feels like it's a whole generation of ideas that we're kind of on the precipice of. So it felt appropriate uh, to add, not like some sort of circus trick, like we might have attributed to it 15 years ago, but instead just part of uh, the new language. I think the same could be said for the piece that I've invited Rebecca Kite to play. It's a six mallet um, solo, but it's super short. It's just an etude and they're fixed intervals. I think it's kind of cruel that with five and six mallet rep, we hand to students, all of a sudden it's like wicked hard stuff. And it's just uh, more mallets is all it is. So why should we all of a sudden have to jump in the deep end of the pool? Um, so I was thinking, it might be kind of cool just to have a six mallet etude instead of just a, a multi-movement work for someone to have to kind of sharpen their teeth on the first time out. Yeah, and um, on, on that note, I just wanted to mention, it just popped in my head, another great four and a third piece is the uh, Akira Yuyama divertimento from Marimba and Alto Sax. Uh, that has, it was written for Keiko Abe. It fits on a four and a third Marimba and it has a brief six mallet section. And it's about the difficulty of the, the polydactyl from your collection. It's just, rolled six note chords that kind of in triads it's it's not that difficult for a beginning six mallet player although that 
the piece is, I would say, more difficult <laughs> as a whole. Well, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so each piece does carry with it, um, well, I suppose, a, a riddle I was trying to solve in terms of uh, technical prowess, but also compositional. Um, uh, one of my favorite uh, movements is a two mallet solo that Robert Chappell is going to perform um, called 2.38 p.m. And it's just, uh, it kind of is informed by WCS scales, and it's just uh, a, a lot of runs up and down the instrument, but not necessarily virtuosic, just particularly challenging harmonies that pay off 20, 30 seconds deep um, beyond when they're presented. I don't know if that makes much sense. I, I think sometimes as instrumentalists uh, who found our voice in the 20th century, we're a little quick to dismiss uh, the function of harmony in our language. And I uh, I think I've really enjoyed in this project, uh, finding a way to actually give voice to uh, harmony that doesn't necessarily always find its way to our convention uh, in percussion. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, some of it's actually pretty approachable. In fact, one of them's Oh, I suppose the the sort of chill beach music you would expect from a, a Key West uh, <laughs> collection, but only one of them. The other eleven are are not. <laughs> right, which is that the one that Naoko is playing? No, uh, Naoko's. Uh, oh, that's savage. If there is one that's like most like uh, a Julie Spencer homage, it's probably that one. It's uh, or maybe David Friedman. Like it, it grooves pretty hard. Um, no, this is the one that um, that Ming that Ming is playing. Um, it just has a lot of really rich uh, kind of, well, you know how we have this kind of renaissance of, uh, of neo-romantic writing going on right now for Maramba? Uh, it's, it's kind of dipping its toes into that where like we don't mind <laughs> uh, putting, uh, putting a, a diminished sevens in and just like really milking them for 20 seconds, you know, like that, that can be really fun and not having to quickly move on to the next thing and just kind of lean into the, a Gershwin idea. Yeah, yeah. And I guess we should probably mention that this collection of works we've been discussing at length is published <laughs> by, <laughs> by C. Allen. It's, it's available, I think, as a PDF or in print. Um, and I'm sure they'll have copies at PASIC. Um, but Ben, since you mentioned Julie Spencer, I, I wanted to jump to my question about Julie Spencer. Uh, you and I had discussed previously that we both have this mutual admiration for percussionist and composer Julie Spencer. And I wanted to mention that in addition to being the amazing player that she is, Julie Spencer, I think, is also maybe the nicest percussionist, I, nicest person I've ever met. Uh, she's just a truly warm person. Uh, we had her on the podcast many, many moons ago, uh, and it was just it was just a wonderful time to sit down with her. Uh, and Ben, I wanted to mention that you're also one of the nicest percussionists I've met. Ben and I, after I played his piece, we just sat and had kind of a nice, probably hour long chat about life. And stuff. <laughs> so it was nice. We don't get to do that enough. Um, but Ben, what is it about Julie that inspires you so much? Oh, gosh. In short, I know. Oh, <laughs> well, sure. Yeah. No, <laughs> so, so we only have the hour, right? You know? <laughs> uh, uh, First of all, I, I hold very similar sentiments about uh, Julie. I, I suspect most people who know her have had similar experiences. That's it's a big part of how I suspect the percussion world engages Julie Spencer. Uh, for me, it, it's it runs a little different. Um, in fact, it has to do with that time that I'd seen Michael Burrett. Uh, that next summer, I attended a camp at Eastern Illinois University called the United States Percussion Camp. Um, did anyone on this, on this call attend that? It was hosted by Johnny Lee Lane, and it was this wildly successful camp in the 90s where he had like upwards of 200 kids. Uh, it was this audacious undertaking, and Julie was on faculty there, and I was in her keyboard class. So she was teaching this class. And at this time in my life, I was, I think, a sophomore, uh, maybe a junior, but I was kind of, um, uh, to describe it, I feel I feel it's a little tone deaf to say it this way, but hopefully people can roll with me on it. I I was a Jesus T-shirt kid. D does that mean anything to you? <laughs> like, I was like I was like super involved in my youth group. I was really excited about going and being a minister when I grew up, and and maybe if I wasn't going to be a minister, I could slum it as a music educator. But like this was a big part of of how I identified, and, and so I would show up, and I, like that was. Uh, it was always in the foreground, you know, and 
And so sure enough, I was there at camp and Julie just in passing one day after class said, hey, cool t-shirt, <laughs> you know, and it, I don't even remember what the shirt was, but I'm, I'm sure it was a Jesus t-shirt, right? And, um, and that kind of opened the door for us to have conversations over the course of the week, uh, eventually over lunch. Um, the next summer I came back and we had a couple of lessons and soon we were actually pen pals, like me, a high school kid. and. And there she was, probably in her mid to late twenties. It's not surprising was, me at all. She's so well, nice, <laughs> right? And and like she was carving out time. And then like fast forward five years, and she had suggested all sorts of books to me, like oh gosh, what the inner game of tennis, uh, inner game of music, Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, Zen and Zen and the art of archery, the pillars of Zen, and it was uh, challenging for me as a young Christian to have someone. Uh, who I respected so much, who was talking about words like faith and hope and love and grace, uh, to not be pulling from a Christian pool of ideas, but instead a whole, like all these other cultures. So at a, at a young age, um, I was uh, being introduced to a lot of ideas uh, by Julie. Uh, and I, I don't know that I can really speak to her state of affairs and her spiritual walk uh, at that time or certainly now, but I know for me, it opened my eyes to the idea that a Christian needn't be um, scared of other cultures. And uh, over the course of my adulthood, my relationship with Christianity has gone through different uh, different iterations as well. And now when I think of Julie, I think of someone who actually carved out time to hang with a high school kid and like actually write notes. I mean, I just, I have a hard time imagining me doing that. You know, uh, she's just so generous of spirit and she's always coming from that place. I've been kind of inspired the last few years uh, when people talk about uh, words like peace or spirit, uh, they almost always attribute stillness to it. Um, but of course, here's Julie talking about a stillness of mind, but then just kind of shredding it on the instrument, right? And she's like bringing full virtuosity. But you could tell, I mean, it, it, for her, it's quite possibly the most relaxed uh, part of her day is just, uh, you know, blurring, blurring across the instrument. And that at a young age defined my relationship with our craft is to understand that the practice room might very well be the most peaceful uh, state of mind. And I guess that never really changed. It's just gone through different iterations in my life. So as I'm getting older and I'm seeing students and their relationship with their, with their instrument, I realize that I owe so much to Julie because she would say things like, if you do it right, um, uh, practicing marimba can be the most relaxing thing in your life. And I learned at a young age that virtuosity is kind of useless unless it's in service of something, you know, like just playing fast is kind of silly. Uh, you, you need to craft good music with it. Right. Yeah. And then when you take it the next step and it's not just good chops, but then good music, but then a good person on top of that, like that's this like wicked trifecta of awesomeness. <laughs> and I was just really fortunate to find that at, at a young age. And I've, I, I'm a little embarrassed to say that I always kind of held that standard for every one of my teachers ever since then, you know, <laughs> where it's like, that's good that you're a good musician, but are you a good person? <laughs> you know? and, and that was a whole nother thing that I had to learn was that it's none of my business uh, to pass judgment on whether or not someone's a good person, right? <laughs> but it's a if wonderful bonus. If the bar is Julie Spencer, you're probably going to be disappointed by me. Well, <laughs> totally. Yeah. And I spent a lot of my time just being like, oh, well, that's cool. But I heard that person say a swear word. I bet Julie Spencer never swears. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the last couple of years, I've been kind of excited to see Julie um, not being scared to say some challenging things online and to bring some um, some challenging ideas on her social uh, media presence because for me as i've gotten older and i enjoy a certain degree of uh, a certain degree of uh, stature in my local community be it um, teaching at a college or uh, in some in some circles like the, the composition side i don't know when to use any of that right like it's like this currency that doesn't quite like i don't know how to spend it and here's julie just kind of going with flamethrowers <laughs> like and that was a version of julie i didn't imagine when i was younger and to know that it comes from a place of love and that it comes from a place of uh, a passion for justice is exciting for me 
And I'm just still trying to find my voice in that. I was just going to say, I think this episode is rapidly turning into me sprinkling my favorite 4.3 Maremma pieces throughout. But <laughs> I wanted to mention one of Julie's pieces, probably my favorite piece of Julie Spencer's is called Almost 5 a.m., which I'm almost positive fits on a four and a third Maremma. Uh, and it's a two mallet piece. And you mentioned Julie's formidable two mallet technique. Uh, and uh, this falls into that category. I mean, not, not a piece for the faint of heart. It's it's this incredibly virtuosic yet meditative, not at all challenging sounding thing. Uh, and she played it at PASIC, God, probably about 10 years ago at this point. Uh, and I mean, and she improvised on it at that point. And it was just, it, Julie's just mind blowing every time. I, <laughs> <laughs> I remember that, that performance, yeah. Ben, uh, you and I previously discussed that as a composer, you release a piece into the world and then it has a life of its own. Uh, you might come across a performance of your own work that is not at all what you intended in a good or a bad way. Uh, has this changed your approach to composition at all? And has a performer ever taught you something you didn't know about one of your own pieces? Yes and yes, absolutely. Uh, no questions uh, about that for me. Would you like me to expound on it? <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> okay. yeah, uh, I've come to appreciate that um, composers, we often uh, have our own ideas of how something's going to sound, but the role of the performer sometimes is to make an even better sound than the composer might have dreamt up. And sometimes that means like making big audacious choices that the that the composer might not have thought of in the first place. I'm, I'm thinking of like mallet choices where I might have said, you know, let's do this. And then the person comes back with like, no, I was thinking of just a full on plastic mallet here. And uh, I think, well, like, like Pegasus is a good example. I remember recording this, uh, what feels like forever ago. And uh, one of the performers used drumsticks on these like high piccolo wood blocks. And like, that was a big no, no in my head at the time, but it sounded so much cooler. Right. So for me, uh, just about every time someone has performed a piece, I feel like I learn something when they don that role of the performer. I know uh, we have a lot of kind of uh, percussion performer composer types. Uh, for me, it's just such a rich experience seeing someone else uh, take take what I write and run with it. I, in many ways, I feel like, I don't know, like, like I design playgrounds and then other people uh, go to work on that or a dungeon master or something like that. Uh, so to me, it's not so much about someone manifesting my vision, but giving someone a vehicle by through which they could manifest theirs. And I if, think if it, I could interrupt in, in our conversation, yeah. Ben had this beautiful like take on it. Like, no, I, I don't, I don't need to be the star performing my own, my own pieces. Like I, I enjoy hearing other people play my music. Like that's the, that's the fun of composing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know for me it is. And by the time I write that that final bar line, like there's a good four thousand versions of that piece in my head. Like it, it's actually pretty hard for me to hold on to what that is. And I wonder if that's something I caught from Julie or what whatnot. Because I, I've wondered that, or like how many different versions of Keiko things there are out there. Uh, so when someone can pick pick up the ball there and say, "Okay, I'm going to craft this," uh, so all of these wise choices are being made at every step along the way in a granular fashion. I really appreciate that, and almost all the time I've lost an appetite for that. I'm, I'm thinking of that same year that Julie played at PASIC was the year that we premiered um, Hard Boiled Capitalism with Mike Truesdell. And uh, that was like 10 years ago, right? No, no, maybe 11 now that I think about it. No, 10 years. And uh, Mike just shredded that, right? Like, and there's, it's been a decade, and there's nothing in me that wants to play that piece. Right. And, and I enjoy the piece. I'm thrilled watching other people play it. Like, did you see Tomas, uh, uh, his video in Poland? Like, is this absurdly good version of it that I never would have dreamt of even 10 years ago and a decade ago, Mike blew my mind playing it. So I think that whole that whole continuum, I think, is also available to performers, too. Like, I have a hard time imagining Mike Truesdale watching that video, folding his arms and like being grumpy about it. So, yeah, uh, to me, uh, composition, it does feel like uh, something that I'm happy to watch other people run with. Yeah. Well, Ben, speaking of um, your compositions, I have been a really big fan of your snare drum writing, especially for like 10 plus years. I just I really like it. And I'm, I'm wondering 
if you can tell us a little bit about your influences in the style that you write for the snare drum. When, when we trace our influences, uh, I've, I've wondered if 10 years from now, I'm going to trace influences differently. Does that make sense? Like uh, when people would ask 10 years ago, uh, what snare drum uh, writing informed your choices, say for a whimsical nature, uh, I would have said, uh, why Delacluse, of course. <laughs> uh, but I realize now that it's probably just as informed by the pianist Gonzalo Rubalcaba, uh, the Afro-Cuban pianist, and his relationship with rhythm. And it's not so much about snare drum for me, but just about rhythm. Uh, also, Indian drumming is pretty extraordinary to me. And I enjoy kind of pop derivative relationships with that, specifically the group Shakti with the guitarist John McLaughlin. Uh, so uh, are you familiar with this at all? Uh, John McLaughlin and his group Shakti? OK. Oh. In, in the 60s and the 70s, uh, uh, he had grown, I don't know what the right word is, but he had grown in his relationship with jazz such that he felt it necessary to go to India and to spend a lot of time uh, studying Indian classical music. And then he came back with the super group um, of, of Indian musicians and they were just shredding. And uh, uh, so when you, when you hear about the Mahavishnu Orchestra with the guitarist John McLaughlin, he also had this acoustic project that has its own life of Shakti and then uh, different iterations of it now uh, called uh, Remember Shakti. Um, so I, I think that was probably my strongest influences. So probably not even uh, snare drummers, but if if I had like a biggest influence in the snare drum realm, uh, probably finds its way to Warren Benson and his, his composition Three Dances for Snare Drum. Uh, and that kind of blew my mind at a really young age, just to think that uh, that these things were possible. Again, back in this room in at Valley City, North Dakota, when I just didn't have a teacher for a while. Um, also, the oh gosh, the the Michael Colgrass uh, six. Ooh, help me. Are you guys familiar with what I'm talking six about? Unaccompanied six yeah. unaccompanied yeah. solos. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I enjoyed that that these solos write for different um, iterations of snare drum, but they're not too pretentious when they do. It's, I mean, it's not like someone's like pouring rice on it and reciting poetry while, while it's happening or something, right? Uh, it, it still dances. And that's important to me when it comes to drums. Um, I'm not a big fan of like, I don't know, blowing a rim or something. Um, but I, I'm pretty excited when I do see it. <laughs> well, I'm not disappointed at all by any of those answers. I'm thrilled. What, what I like about your writing so much is it's always creative and melodic and musical. Um, and then I also see like a blend of different technical traditions on snare drum. You know, there's some rudimental stuff, some Delacluzzi, you know, orchestral stuff in there. And it's just cool. So I'm thrilled to know about your, your influences. Oh, I appreciate that, Carly. Thank you so much. I would say, you know, we all mentioned playing Pegasus um, in our studios right now. And um, that piece, I think like a lot of your works, it's very, easy to listen to it's audience friendly but it does that thing that um, I think just like seldom some compositions do where the music theorist in the room and the contemporary composers in the room are going to find something in it that they can talk about but then also like the 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 parents can walk away whistling something and like both people will leave happy whereas usually those are like in direct opposition to each other and I feel like a lot of your music does that. I know we've mentioned that with like, say like Terry DeMay table music. It's like, oh yeah, you can like really nerd out after that performance. And you could also like be a five-year-old in the audience and think that was really fun. And it's, um, it, yeah, it's just, it's really cool. It, it takes a really good composer, I think, to, to do that. But question for you, um, uh, man, anything you could tell us about Pegasus? I just love it so much. I just love to, like <laughs> any insight and from like, I don't know, just anything you'd be willing to tell us about it. I'd be happy to hear. Sure. I'd be happy to, uh, and first, I, I want to thank you very much, Casey, for, for those thoughts. Uh, it means a lot to me because it's a big part of uh, what I think about when I write is I, I do kind of think of uh, that that relationship between the audience, the performer and the co composer like this kind of holy trinity, you know, um, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of difficult choices that go into the craft, you know, when we're composing and mm -hmm. and uh, that, that informs a lot of this. As for Pegasus, um, this was one of my it was commissioned by a classmate when I was a grad student. Um, 
and I think he had all of like $75 <laughs> and, and I wrote it for him. He was a runner and uh, uh, like I was young enough that like, I, I thought this was like real, like groundbreaking stuff. It's like, okay, so this is going to be what it's like to go for a run. <laughs> so it's just that simple, you know? <laughs> so uh, yeah. And uh, I think this young man um, ended up just taking on a career not even in music shortly after he graduated. And I think he might have even served in the army, you know, but, uh, uh, but yeah, uh, Pegasus is uh, basically about someone waking up really early in the day and going on a jog. Hmm, cool. I, yeah. I um, did, you know, I, I, ever since I've known you, you've been real tied to teaching. Um, like you explained this new series of low A uh, pieces from Marimba and the need for it came from like a pedagogical standpoint. And it's just kind of a, a fun story for me this semester. Of course, I played Pegasus years ago as a, the snare solo, and then we had some students play it um, just, just a few years ago here at JMU, and now a group's doing it again of different students, and I pretty much left them alone. I've left them to rehearse themselves, and they're playing it so good <laughs> like they're oh, playing cool. it and they're and they're some of my my you know uh, seniors um and and some of the real you know self-motivated uh lot of students and it just it kind of feels like hey ben's doing his thing <laughs> like i <laughs> i'm i'm rehearsing the other group in the other room or i'm in my office doing whatever and ben's here doing the thing he does best and uh, it's really <laughs> really cheesy sorry but that's what the thought that occurred so anyway thanks for the cool piece Oh, no, I really appreciate that. Thank you. And I, I feel like I owe an apology uh, to performers whenever they play this. Um, the person who plays bass drum, I think, also has to hold a crotale mallet in the same hand. Yeah, that's um, fine. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, wish, I wish I could go back and solve that one. So No, no, uh, no, no, it's fine. It's good. Right. Hey, so you were just complaining about that sort of thing on the last episode. <laughs> this is, oh, you're right, you're right. This is a different kind of thing. That's Literally was reasonable. like, no, don't, no, don't ever make people like play chimes and kick drum at the same time. <laughs> oh, yeah, you don't know. You don't know what I'm talking about. I'll show you a score sometimes like chun mallet here, vibe oh. mallet there, stick here, triangle beater there. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. And loop pedal. <laughs> and loop, right, and loop pedal, yeah. Well, Ben, speaking of composition, uh, do you think that all percussionists should compose? And what are some composition exercises you might prescribe for a beginning percussionist composer? I do think that not just all percussionists, but all musicians should do themselves the favor of composing. Uh, I think we're at a, a weird crossroads right now as a community where we uh, are consumers of media. And then when we reverse that, we call it content, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as if it's something to be uh, traded, you know, or, or somehow monetized. And somewhere in the middle is creativity and what it is to give voice to what it is to be human and not just like a one or a zero, right? Uh, my favorite experiences in music all, almost always involve some degree of celebration of the creative, right? Um, so I, I think it's helpful to leave the idea that people are born creative, like on a shelf somewhere, and indulge the idea that maybe creativity is a skill set and it's not a character trait. And for me, uh, composing is a really big part of what it is to uh, develop our creativity. Uh, just like reading interesting books or watching interesting movies is super important that we not just kind of go to our diet of, of intellect to numb things, but instead to engage. Uh, so I, I think a lot of people are scared of composing because they're so preoccupied with whether or not it's good or bad or something. Um, I, I think I have probably 800 to a thousand times as many things written and not published than things that are published right like I, uh, like a huge part of what it is to compose is to throw stuff away i was just going to inter interject and say blake tyson has said something similar and he said like in fact the first thing you compose probably shouldn't be good was your first performance in sixth grade really any good like you have to start totally. somewhere with it yeah well totally yeah i had a composition teacher um who said <laughs> the hardest part of potty training was getting his daughter to flush um, because you see, she had created that, uh, and she just didn't want to throw it away. <laughs> but sometimes you just got to flush. Casey, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, 
I know I, I'm not worried about flushing. If he never flushes, I don't care. It's just it's going in the it's going in the potty. It's oh, it's I was done. talking about you, not Robin. Oh <laughs> yeah, I'm still working on all that. <laughs> it's good to have goals. Yeah, <laughs> have goals. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it weird though, Ben? Like you know, like st people who don't compose, you know, they'll ask like those ask like, how do you do it? And <laughs> I feel like you know, it always comes up. I think it's coming up in a social media question. Um, it's just like, you know, how do you do it? Like I, and, and the answers are really, um, I'm throwing myself under the bus too. Like the answers aren't, aren't very good. Like, how do you compose? <laughs> it's like, oh yeah. You know, like, like you just like jot it, write it down when it comes to you. And like, oh, I just like, I like found a melody I like, and I put it down or, or I like screwed around on the instrument for a while. I was like, oh, I like that. So I write down like the answers really suck. Like, it's like, yeah, well, that's, yeah, you're describing writing. That's what they can't do. You know, like, that's what they're saying. They, 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 they don't know how to do. And, and I, it's very hard for people to answer this. And I think it's, it's very hard for me to answer this. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I don't know. Like, yeah. Why did that melody come to me? Or why did that idea come to me? And, and what can we do to, you know, I, I don't know, maybe advise young people who want to get started. I, I do like hearing you say that, um, it shares me with it, it. It excites me to hear that you've had similar experiences because for me, my answers have gotten better. The more I have that conversation, because even talking about composing, I suck at it. You know, like like we have composition faculty at my school who are way better at having that conversation than I am. I'm good about like this is how you hit a triangle, and they're good, they're good at saying this is the difference between a major sixth and a minor third. You know? yeah. I believe that we're doing our students a big disservice right now at, at elementary, middle school, and high school by not engaging improvisation more and not engaging composition more. Uh, so uh, those of us who do end up going into this field professionally, we really do have like a fifth or a sixth grade relationship where, with it, not just in terms of skill sets, but also their emotional uh, attachment to it. Like I, ha I know people who are so terrified to just put note, uh, to put pen to paper because they're just sure that everyone's going to laugh them out of the room. And you said it so well, like, of course, it's going to be bad for a while, like embrace that. <laughs> and, and, and I, I, frankly, I'm embarrassed about some of my pieces that uh, have been published, you know, uh, but that's also what it is to grow. Like, I would hope I'm not as excited about something that was published in 2000 as I was in 2000, right? That was 20 years ago, right? Uh, so I, I did write down some th suggestions to, to young students who might be interested if you want to hear them. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, there is a craft to composing. Like you don't just like get hit by a lightning bolt, right? Um, every now and then, for me, I do get super inspired, and it's just like one really ecstatic, amazing evening or a morning, and like eight hundred measures later, you're like, "Wow, that was amazing!" And then like a week later, you go back and you slice it down, and it's like four hundred measures, um, and hopefully you find something good there. But if you haven't actually studied the craft of, of composition, uh, it, it's a little more challenging. So things like counterpoint, species counterpoint can be super helpful. Actually taking your music theory and ear training classes seriously, like this matters. Uh, I did a bit of a study of Heinrich Schenker at the graduate level, and that informs a huge part of how I write. The idea that um, you can plant uh, something right away in the first measure that's going to pay off 20 minutes later is a, a powerful one. And we don't really have many opportunities for that uh, in nature. But uh, so there's that uh, uh, more practical suggestions would be to try writing themes and variations. Like if you find that one melody you do like, uh, try to come up with 15 other versions of it, like get good at coming up with different versions of things. Um, also try ripping people off. Like, uh, let's say you really like Let's say there's a, a Carly B song you like, and like, what does it sound like if Ivan Trevino arranges it versus uh, Pius, right? Like, what does a Pius version of, of a Carly B song sound like? Um, and Casey, I'm not going to invite you to chime in on that because I'm afraid of what you would say. Right? Um, of course, improvisation. Um, improvisation is huge. If uh, if we don't get comfortable with our own voice, you know, how do we expect other people to engage it? then group improvisation is awesome. And 
I would encourage students not to shy away from their jazz combos uh, or even like super artsy uh, what it is to camp out with other percussionists at two in the morning in the percussion room and your Boeing music stands and stuff. Uh, fall in love with the next idea. Um, that same brain that came up with that first idea uh, can come up with another one. Like it doesn't have to be so precious, right? Uh, like just because I love the thing I thought up today, that doesn't necessarily mean that tomorrow I'm not going to come up with a better idea. Uh, so I needn't be so scared to lose these things. And then finally, uh, give yourself permission to write with the sound off uh, if you're at your computer or to actually be away from the instrument when you write. Uh, like don't don't fall in love with your sound card um, on your computer and try to keep these sounds fresh. Let's remember what a snare drum actually sounds like instead of just what Sibelius is trying to tell us it sounds like. Yeah, so I guess, oh, and also try finishing projects. A lot of us get so like wrapped up beginning it and then we get lost in the weeds in the middle. Give yourself permission to call something done and move on and don't spend too much time dwelling on whether or not it was good or bad you never quite know um yeah uh, that's for other people to decide i think and the, what's delightful is it's not really any of their business how is it <laughs> so, yeah i'm sorry i, I ranted a little hard <laughs> that's great yeah that's that's the whole point um i always think when people ask this question like how do you compose you know and, and they i don't know if they want an answer that's different than sit in your chair and like do it you know the same way how do you write an article or how do you write anything um but i think what they're what they're meaning is like how do you how do you break out of your shell and feel brave enough to put ideas on paper and then tell someone i wrote this piece and you can play it you know or i can play it and, and present it to the world um and that's that's a different question than you know the ins and outs like technically how do you sit down and write but i I'm glad to hear you frame it this way, because it does bring me to uh, something that has changed my relationship with composition over the course of the last 10 years for me. I've grown to see composition kind of akin to community service. Uh, I, I started learning that not everyone perceives music the same way I do, right? Um, and I would imagine most people don't perceive music the same way. Uh, but if I don't have this backdrop that everything I right has to be published but instead it just helps give voice to an idea or for another person uh, that helps me trust the process does this make sense so so if if someone were to say um i'm really interested in a critale solo i just can't find any critale solos and i love the sound and i i really want that can you help me with this um then that question of whether or not it's good or bad goes out the window. Instead, I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm helping my friend find a voice on Quartales. Uh, composition doesn't pay my bills. And if, if you have a healthy life away from your craft, you don't have to be preoccupied with what, uh, what it gets you in terms of your career either, right? So uh, if it's a one-off performance where a Quartale solo person just plays it that one time and they can smile and go home happy. Like that's plenty, like that's a win, that's a big win. And I suspect Casey has been in this boat too. Like, have you had had it happen where like you work really hard on a piece for a person and they play it once and then both of you just kind of walk away? <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, or not at all, you know? Sure, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. so, so yeah. for me, so for me, Carly, I, I think that the, emotionally intelligent way of engaging uh, composition has its roots in service uh, to bear in mind that you could give voice to either a person or a concept should you be the one uh, performing to help them bring voice to something in the world. I, um, I, I feel like I, I owe an apology to anyone if this is kind of upsetting to hear, but my first commission was from a friend of mine who uh, she had lost a child and she just didn't, she didn't have, uh, well, so she didn't, she was trying to find a way to come to grips with what it is to have lost a child. And uh, her therapist suggested having a, a service, like a, like a full on memorial service. And this young woman couldn't find uh, the appropriate music. So she had asked me to write a piece for her. And that was the first commission I had. 
and that that really framed how how it is to write for other people um, over the course of my career. And that was 1999. Uh, so since then, I guess I'm not terribly excited. Uh, I, I'm not all that interested about writing that next big, most amazing hit. I'm interested uh, to help people find voice in their life through music. Uh, and if it means something gets published, fine. If not, no. Like I've I've spent so much time writing arrangements for groups that I'm directing or something like that. I'm I'm thinking, Casey, do you remember when you were a guest up at Birch Creek and we did that piece with all those cell phones? Yeah. Like, why on earth should I publish that? Right? <laughs> like, it was like such a peculiar, weird piece that like like how do you even write that down? Right? Um, I but, mean, yeah. But that was yeah. a super special memory and mm -hmm. we get to just have that in a barn in Wisconsin, right? Uh, so I think if we give ourselves permission to not have to have something that has this huge footprint in in antiquity, uh, well after we're, we're done, and just to let art be what it is, uh, I think that's okay. You know, it reminds yeah. me, I, I remember hearing Shi Yi Wu talk about, like she said, I'm, I'm, I'm not really interested in these giant 50 people co-commission a piece. Like I. I want to work with the composer like I want, I want the piece to be for me like I think that's an, an interesting take on it because that's so often like oh yeah I wrote my check to so-and-so for 50 bucks and I'll get a vibraphone piece in a year you know <laughs> um but you know one thing hearing you talk about all this and you mentioned like studying Schenker and like serious serious like harmonic composition and all I think one thing that might be encouraging for a young student is uh I feel like so often the idea of composition is hearing a piece and then writing it down, like coming up with this creative idea and then writing it down. And I think you could, a, a student could certainly make up an exercise where you write something down to see what it does sound like. And there are a few composers, like David Lang is a composer I can think of that he says, I'm, I'm interested in writing the music that's not been written yet. Uh, and uh, like, I don't know if anyone has, has seen the score for the piece Extremes by Jason Troiting. Uh, but I, I almost did it with my percussion ensemble several, several years ago, and I got the score. I was like, what, what is this? <laughs> it's, it's not what I expected. Like, right, it's just words, parts, right? Yeah, yeah, like the four parts are derived from four, like, city names. I don't remember what the names are, uh, but, like, vowels have a certain value and consonants have a certain value, and it's, like, it's such a cool piece, but, like, you need to know absolutely nothing about harmony to write that piece and I mean really like anyone could have come up with that piece it, it didn't even need to be a musician it's just you pick four city names at random you could even probably swap out different names in it and it would still somehow work um so I don't know just use the interesting thought for me so you have to know a lot about how music works and how it can work to even know like oh I could extract a piece from city names like it's yeah yeah you know like it takes a ton of know-how to like hmm how can I yeah but I mean like, like the point is like you don't have to create know, tools like, sorry yeah, to, like, you don't have to, to create to... tools for a piece you have to know a lot about yeah, how yeah, a exactly. piece would work you well, know? like you don't have to know anything about a bot corral to write table music for example although there's sort of a fugue in that but there's, I think there's so many interesting works that that come from this perspective of like, let me write something down and then see what the result is rather than I have the result in my head and then I write it down. I don't know. I I, I don't compose, so I shouldn't be talking about this, but I just, it was yeah, an then, about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I will now. <laughs> Give me some sitting. <laughs> you know, before the, um, before the podcast, we were talking about my friend Chris Dandelis, right? And how nice it is to be able to put ideas in front of him. Um, and shout out to you, Chris. Uh, happy November 4th. Uh, by the way, as we're nearing the end here, you were talking about history on this day. On November 6th, 50 years ago, my parents got married. How cool is that? Hey, I'm right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but to bring it back to the composition side, <laughs> um, Chris Dandelis is one of these people that I feel like I can put any composition in front of and ask his thoughts on it, right? Uh, like literally the Mile Marker Zero collection, he read through all 12 of them on his marimba at his house, right? Uh, it's nice having people that you can put these things in front of. Uh, ben, you were talking about what it is to just uh, just offer a thing, right? Just to have something on paper somewhere. It's nice to have teammates who have got your back when you are having a hard time telling if it's good or bad, right? Uh, and the good or bad sentiment, that doesn't that doesn't fly for me. I think I, I like to talk about it more in terms of what's effective and what's not, more so than what's good, good and bad, you know? Yeah. 
so yeah, uh, sharing it with with uh, with uh, people who are prepared to give you healthy feedback is also really helpful. And then you get good at what it is to uh, that skill set of what it is to hand something off to someone and get their thoughts on it. Well, Ben, you know, we do have a couple social media questions for you. I think it'll just be one quick one because we've covered this one from Paul, which was how do you approach a new composition or idea? We certainly just got out of that. Thanks so much, Paul. He also says, love your new duet, uh, Limbic System. So thanks, oh, cool. Paul. And another question from Dmitry Konovolchek. He says, what is the main idea of hard-boiled capitalism? And he also asked who inspires you, but we've we've been through that. So yeah, thanks, Dimitri. Well, first, uh, Dimitri, I'd like to answer your second question first. I know we talked on touched on Julie Spencer, but I gotta let you know, uh, somehow uh, along the way, you know, I'm 44 years old, and just about every day I'm inspired by someone. Um, I, I don't know uh, how it is that I've been fortunate enough to get to this point as an adult, but my students inspire me a lot. My colleagues inspire me a lot. My wife inspires me a lot. Um, and almost always in surprising ways. Uh, somehow in this kind of social media ecosystem, maybe it's just because I just don't engage it that much. Um, I've, I've found myself fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of inspiring people. And I think it has a lot to do with what we pay attention to in the world, like what frequencies we kind of hone in on. Because uh, I suppose I just as easily, if I had a predisposition to not being inspired, uh, wouldn't find that inspiration. So, uh, so Dimitri, I'm glad you're asking that because, yep, in the early 90s, Julie Spencer rocked my world and I'm still trying to recover from that. But since then, there's been thousands of people, right? And and I would gladly spend the next five hours just talking about all of them. Uh, so, uh, Dimitri, thanks for asking that. They're not always musicians, and I know my relationship with music is fueled in a large way um, outside of my music community. Uh, I was just at a dog show with my wife today, and uh, and there was a woman there who was just like running the whole thing and she was just so impressive at how she was actually like running these different like literally rings of dog competitions and and a complete stranger she and i never talked but i was just so impressed with how well she was doing that and it inspired me right um and whether or not that spawns a piece to me is quite irrelevant but uh dimitri i'm glad you're asking that because uh if we go through life like curious for what it is that both inspires ourselves and to the 7 billion people on the planet. It's a much more exciting life, right? So there's that. First half of the question uh, is actually pretty easy. Um, the piece Hard Boiled Capitalism um, also has a, a subtitle, um, The Day That Mr. Friedman Realized um, Google is a Verb, uh, that takes its title from two Mr. Friedmans. Um, and I'll be happy to talk about a third one too. The first one is Milton Friedman, uh, The Economist, and then um, Thomas Friedman, who wrote The World is Flat. Um, and I happen to have been reading both of those books that summer, and this was the summer of 2008. Um, and that's when there was a really big economic scare in the United States. Uh, what did we call it? The Great Recession at that time? Do you remember this? The 2008, like, yeah, so uh, so American economy kind of took it uh, on the nose. and. Um, and I knew a lot of people who were just full on terrified. So uh, hard boiled capitalism kind of spoke to what was kind of in the air that fall. And uh, it seems to be tied to the United States, which we still are uh, coming to grips with what it is for uh, other countries to be turning into industrialized nations as well. So it was kind of a scary time for some people. And for some people, it's still quite scary. So that's what that is. It's all about the panic uh, that was happening in 2008 and reconciling what it is for people trying to live in the past and live in the future. Uh, I will offer one time I got a, a Facebook message from David Friedman saying, uh, so um, so were you ever going to ask ask me about if you could use my name on this piece? <laughs> <You know>? um, <laughs> Um. <laughs> and uh, right, like he, he had he had asked it much more friendly than that you know he was he was a, a very cool customer you know uh, but I, I never really dreamt that I ever would have been on his radar because um, his music also really kind of blew my mind at a young age it still does so I what think. did you say 
To no, I, I directed him to Milton Friedman and to Thomas Friedman and the two books. And, <laughs> but I, I did, I did like just shovel on a whole bunch of adulations and how much I loved Double Image and uh, how Double Image kind of rocked my world. Uh, I, I would offer up. Some people don't know that Double Image was a quartet at one point, right? And uh, some of the early Double Image stuff is just hysterically cool. <laughs> To be fair, I had also assumed it was David Friedman. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ben, thank you so much for your, your generous time tonight. Uh, I just had one other thing I wanted to mention to all of our listeners. We've talked a lot about influences and inspirations. And one of my mentors, Christopher Dean, who taught at the University of North Texas, just passed away on October 9th. We're very Sorry to hear about this loss. Um, and it's been sort of funny since, since he passed away, people have been posting all their memories and condolences and things. And a friend of mine, Zach Shear, posted uh, Mr. Dean's 45 lessons in 15 minutes, uh, which if you're on Facebook, you can, you can find uh, on Mr. Dean's wall. Uh, uh, and I was just absolutely blown away when I read this as to how much of an influence he had on me. I already knew he had a huge influence over me with how much I had studied, but when I read these 45 lessons in 15 minutes, which I had somehow never seen, uh, so much so much of it is what I teach my students. Um, and I wanted to share the first one in particular because I think it's so profound. He says, music isn't hard. Bricks are hard, music is time consuming. If you think of music as being hard, you have built a brick wall between you and your goal. Uh, and Mr. Dean's works are some of the most outstanding, thoughtful pieces for percussion. Um, one more four and a third piece to check out is his The Process of Invention, which Mark Ward did a wonderful recording of. Uh, it's about a, I think it's 12 or 15 minute long piece, uh, kind of loosely inspired by some Baroque ideas. Um, but just an absolutely wonderful piece. His piece, A Robe of Orange Flame, is this breathtaking 30 minute long thunder sheet solo that I can't even begin to describe the impact that piece had on me as a musician and a thinker really outside of music. So uh, thank you so much, Mr. Dean, for all the wonderful lessons that you taught all of us at the University of North Texas and beyond, and you will be sorely missed. So uh, I think that just about wraps it up for today. Thank you so much, Ben, for your generous time, and we will see you all on the next episode. Thank you very much. <laughs>